Good evening, everyone. We're just letting uh, everyone start coming in and uh, we'll give that a couple of minutes and then we will get started. All right, give it about 30 more seconds. All right, welcome everyone to our caregiver webinar. Um, we will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna hand it off to our lovely director of OT, Mae London, here in just a moment. A few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, just enter them in the Q&A section and we will get to them at the end of the session. Um, if you miss anything or wanna listen to it again, we're recording the session and I'll email it out to all of you guys tomorrow. Um, but other than that, Maeve, go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is Maeve London. I am a pediatric occupational therapist um, and it is my pleasure to work here at Beerman Autism Centers. I'm really excited to talk to you today about fine motor because it's such an integral part of our development and obviously our everyday lives. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to walking you through um, some of the intricacies of fine motor. So my goal here today um, is to make sure that we are hitting upon you know, some anatomy um, there's not going to be a test, but I, it's such a, an important part of understanding uh, what we're asking when we are asking our bodies or, or our children to perform fine motor tasks. Um, we're going to go through some of the key fine motor milestones. And then, of course, you know, for me, it's really important. Obviously, we want to know the what of fine motor, but uh, very often, you know, sometimes I'm in these and I get through and I go, okay, where's the how? How do I implement some of these things? So I, I won't leave you without the how. Uh, we're definitely going to go through some activities to try at home. Um, or even just to get a better understanding, you know, if your child is in occupational therapy and there are some fine motor goals, what are going, you know, what's going on in those sessions and what are the, some of the things being targeted and how. So to start, we've got um, 27 bones in our hands um, and that's just per hand. Uh, so already there's a lot happening, right? We've got our carpals here at the base of our hand, our metacarpals, which then connect to our proximal, middle, and then distal phalanges, which make up our fingers. Um, you know, so we think of these, you know, our, our the heel of our hand, for example, as maybe just one solid bone or two bones, but really we've got eight bones working in concert, floating in ligaments here. Um, so even just, you know, at the very base of our hand, we're really all asking already for a lot of coordination, even before we get up into the fingers. Um, so all of these bones down here that you think of as solid, they're actually floating. So if you were to hold your hand up and grab on to like the heel of your hand, you can actually manipulate that little bone there called the pisiform. Um, you know, bone and bone development is important consideration when we're talking about fine motor development. And here you can see why. Um, sometimes we may say that's not developmentally appropriate or we wouldn't expect a child to do that yet. Um, and looking at, you know, some of these x-rays, you can see why these hands are really doing a lot of work developing, particularly in this carpal area. You can see the distance between, you know, the metacarpals in the palm and the phalanges in the fingers. Um, so if we were to ask that two-year-old or even that four-year-old to do some really precise fine motor, there's not that connection quite yet to make them um, really dexterous. Uh, so if you look at you know, the 14 year old or the 53 year old compared to a two or a four year old, you see that that hand is still doing a lot of work towards creating those connections that, gonna, that are gonna make them successful in their fine motor activities. So very often, you know, we, we might want a four year old to be working on handwriting, for example. Um, and maybe some 
four-year-olds can form letters. But if they can't, we wouldn't be saying that that's in developmentally inappropriate or we'd have concerns at that point because we can see through these x-rays, you know, there that development is still very much actively occurring from a physical perspective. Um, so when we think about our fingers, we actually do not have any muscles in our fingers at all. Um, most of the muscles that control our fingers exist in our forearms. Um, so this is where I wish, you know, I was a bodybuilder, so you can uh, follow along with me. Hopefully you're in better shape than I am, but you can see as you start to flex, these muscles here will start to bulge because they are doing that work of taking those hands and drawing them towards your palm. On the other side, if you hold on to the back of your hand, um, the back of your forearm and you flex backwards, it's called extension, um, you can feel those muscles tighten there as well. So the work being done in your fingers is predominantly done by the muscles in your forearm. There are eight muscles in the anterior compartment of your forearm that are responsible for that flexion piece. Um, and then you have 12 muscles in the posterior compart compartment of your forearm, which are responsible for all the extension. Um, so again, when we're talking about development, right, we might want our kids to do things like maybe make the peace sign or like do a, a rock on. Um, but really what we're, we're looking at is we've got these one big muscle um, and it turns into four ligaments that then control your fingers. So some people can even see it now, you know, if you start to try to isolate a, a middle finger, you see this other finger wanting to come down because it's the same muscle doing that work for both fingers. Um, so if you have some things around digit isolation with kids, um, it's because we've got these big muscles trying to do little jobs. So again, we wanna just make sure that we're taking our time with our kids and understanding that this, this isolation, this fine motor work is something that's gonna come with time. And you're always gonna get the big movements and the big gross motor before you get the small intricate fine motor um, presentations. And then we do have some, some muscles that are um, intrinsic to our hand that exist predominantly in our palm. And they do a lot of work with our thumb. Um, and they also do a lot of work bringing our fingers together and extending them apart. When we're talking about nerves, we're looking at um, the ulnar nerve, which runs here, the radial nerve, which runs here, and the median nerve, which runs along the palm and the back of the hand a little bit. Um, so these nerves obviously do a really important job around touch. Um, there are, while we think of touch as one kind of sensory system, there's actually many different types of touch nerve endings and they all do different jobs. So uh, light touch, uh, deep touch, um, pain and temperature, um, they all are actually different, unique types of nerve endings um, that all have, you know, you know, important kind of components to them. And they give us important information um, that allow us to kind of pick up an egg without crushing it um, or use enough force to to pull open a door. Um, pain and temperature nerve, you know, nerves, obviously, they keep us safe. Uh, they keep us from not touching that hot stove or pulling away when we touch something that's too sharp. Um, so we have really complex nerve systems all through our hands and their big job is obviously touch when we're talking about the hands. So that is our anatomy background. Uh, like I said, you know, no quiz at the end, but I feel it's really helpful to kind of lay the groundwork to really understand the number of muscles, the, the number of bones, the number of nerve and nerve endings involved. Um, and all of a sudden you realize, you know, picking up that pen is actually a really, really complex concert of, of many different systems working together to successfully complete that action. So basically just just looking, you know, grant, you know, big picture development. Um, and it's uh, again, you know, with development, we always want to make the caveat that some people will reach these milestones a little bit early. Some people will, meet, will reach these milestones a little bit later. Um, the most important thing to me as a therapist is not necessarily um, milestones are important. Obviously, you want to pay attention to them, but I want to know where are they now and what's the next step? 
that's really what's most important. Um, we want to just be knowing, okay, here's how they're presenting right now. Here's their skill set right now. There's always a foothold. There's always a place to start. Um, and it's just about now we have the map set out before us of where are we going next um, and how do we most efficiently get there. Um, so when you're looking at about a year to two years old, we're going to start seeing that isolated point um, typically to, to ask for something. Uh, it starts to be kind of our most basic level of communication. We're looking at stacking blocks, which is great to evolve that pincer grasp, which we use so much throughout our day. Um, we start to see a little bit of, you know, independence in, in eating, um, picking up that Cheerio, that piece of edamame, um, turning thick page books which is you know, a really great kind of sequential repetitive action that requires that isolation of the digits to be able to grab onto that page and turn it over. Um, and we're looking at things like matching a circle into a, into a form board or a square or a triangle. Two to three years, we start to see that precision emerge, which is why we go from maybe stacking two blocks to be able to be stacking six to eight blocks um, because we are able to isolate um, use that visual motor piece, that hand-eye coordination to be able to pick something up and stack it without it falling over. Use the right amount of velocity and strength when, when um, you know, working on that skill. We tend to see kids, which is exciting from a developmental perspective, but a little inconvenient sometimes at home. All of a sudden, those jars, uh, which were safe, now you know children can open them independently. Um, so you know, being able to use that rotational movement at two to three years starts to emerge. Um, you start to see more what we call bilateral coordination. So that's two hands doing the same job at midline. So working together, uh, which is a really important milestone. We do a lot of things at midline with our hands in coordination. Um, those can be symmetrical movements or those can be asymmetrical movements. Um, so an asymmetrical movement, for example, would be a zipper. You know, one hand is stabilizing, the other is zipping. Um, that's why we also like to work on stringing beads. One hand is stabilizing that bead, the other one is threading it through. We also get to see some independence um, in things like feeding and, and dressing kind of start to emerge. It might be popping off their, their socks and their shoes, pulling down pants, things like that. All of that requires a certain amount of fine motor finesse. Once you get to three to four years, we start looking at um, imitating block design, what we call constructive play. So being able to see a model and recreate a model. So that might be um, four blocks that make a wall. Um, it might be four blocks that create a little bridge. We start to ask children to, to see something, commit it to memory, and then recreate it themselves. Folding paper is also something that we look at. That's a, an example of that asymmetrical bilateral coordination. So two hands at midline doing a job together, uh, but each hand is being asked to do something slightly different. Four to five years, we start looking at unbuttoning. We start to look at that precision, starts to hone in a little bit. So we might look at stringing some, you know, large beads at two to three, and then we want to shrink those down to maybe small beads on a pipe cleaner by four to five. Um, more intricate, more precise, uh, and that's what we're looking at. When we've got these big objects, we're looking to shrink them down and work those precision muscles. Four to five, we also start to see some emergence with drawing shapes, drawing people, and we'll get into that a little bit more down the line. And finally, at five to six, um, we're looking at more complex structures. We're looking at imaginative play is starting to come in a little bit more, perhaps, and um, children are able to kind of conceptualize and then create some more complex structures. We also would be looking at um, going from maybe a knob puzzle, for example, where they have that big knob that they can grab onto, to being able to pick up, orient, and put down jigsaw pieces. So when we look at GRASP, um, the first thing I kind of want to chat through is, um, A, what's the development that we look at, and then B, why we might even care. Um, so 
when grass first starts to emerge, it's really practical, right? They want to pick up that piece of food. They want to hold on to that object, um, stacking blocks. And then we start to see it kind of shift into some of our coloring, drawing, writing. Um, so around a year to 15 months, we're going to see that great fisted grasp and you're going to get a lot of scribble and everything is going to be generated with these big gross motor muscles. So your shoulder, your biceps, your forearm, and it's going to be, um, everything is going to be generated from, um, up here, right? Um, around two to three, you start to see, they'll start to flip. And this is called pronation when that wrist comes over and you'll start to see them grab and they kind of draw like they're little painters. Um, and you start to see this finger start to push down and orient towards the paper. Now, when they get to be about three to four and you see this, what we call a quadrupod grasp emerge, that's technically um, a functional grip. I know adults who write with this grip, you may write with this grip. There's nothing wrong with this grip. Um, and for some people, that's what works for them. The reason why we, we try to push a little further and why we care to push a little further is because if we can get these fingers in, these fingers stabilize and these fingers do our precision work. So it may be perfectly easy to write our first name with this quadrupod grasp. As academic demands increase over the years and children are asked to write paragraphs or write a story, they're going to fatigue typically with this grasp because they don't have the stabilization there. So they might be hovering that hand above the paper. They're not resting it on the table. Um, and then that's when you can sometimes start to see maybe some avoidance behaviors around writing or coloring. Um, and if we can solve that stabilization and digit isolation piece, we can push that duration and it's not so fatiguing and not so aversive. So that's why it's, you know it's really wonderful to work in a really collaborative environment where, you know, maybe we're seeing some behavior or some avoidance around these tasks, and an OT can come in and look at, you know, how are they sitting in their chair? Are they stable and able to be, you know, at the table for long durations? Are they holding their marker in an optimal way to be able to complete this task without fatigue, discomfort, or pain in their hand? Um, so around three or four, we'd hope to see a static tripod. So that's when, you know, they're holding it like this, which is what we want to see, but they're still probably generating from the forearm, from the wrist, and maybe even from the upper arm. And then when you get into that dynamic tripod, that's when these fingers really start doing the work, right? So it's not, we're just holding on and all the work's being generated here. Now my fingertips are actually doing the work. And that's when we've achieved, um, you know, the most mature pencil or a marker grasp that we can achieve. Hand dominance. Uh, I definitely, you know, I wanted to touch upon this because some people can be really concerned about hand dominance. Um, some people, it, you know, it doesn't really even occur to them. Um, either way is fine, um, but I think it's just helpful to kind of understand how hand dominance um, um, evolves because it actually takes quite a lot longer than most people would typically realize. Um, so under the age of two, it is, it is extremely common. And in fact, we want to see children using their hands um, interchangeably pretty much. Um, it can actually be a signal to dig a little deeper if a child is really favoring one hand early on. Sometimes you can have maybe an issue where, um, you know, there was some nerve damage during birth. And so that child is, is favoring the hand that is functioning more optimally right now. So we absolutely want to see mixed dominance um, for the first couple of years of a child's life. Most child will then start to merge their preferred hand three, four, five, six, but it can technically continue up until eight years old. So if you continue to see um, mixed dominance up until eight, that is developmentally typical, developmentally appropriate. Um, we don't have a, a preference around what hand a child uses. Um, it's just whatever is comfortable for them. They will have a natural proclivity towards one or the other. Um, so my recommendation is always to the best of your ability, just present things at that midline and then let the child initiate towards that object with whatever hand they prefer. Um, and also be aware if there's something, you know, that might be, um, 
giving another hand preference. Like if they're always holding something in one hand, which some of our kids love to do, then they're always going to reach out with that non-dominant. Um, and if we want to be working on grasp or something like that, we want to be making sure both hands are getting equal play or equal access to whatever it is the, the thing that we're trying to do is. Um, I will say that if you are curious about hand dominance, typically the best way to, to know one way or the other, what way they're leaning is to look at that grasp. If a child is holding um, their marker in their left hand like this and their marker in their right hand like this, that means that right now that left hand um, it has a more mature evolved grasp than that right hand does, which may mean that they have a preference for their left hand. Rewriting shapes um, are a really important step in the writing process. Um, these should be uh, where we kind of concentrate all of our efforts as far as evolving our, um, our drawing and our, our work towards formation of letters and numbers. And we wanna make sure that we're attending to this um, prior to, or at least concurrent with uh, after a certain age, um, our letters and our numbers. So right here is the basic um, kind of sequence that a child will follow when they are starting to form all the component parts of what will eventually make up their letters. So, you know, you can see here at two years old, we'd be working in that vertical line. At two and a half, you start to see a horizontal line occur. And even before this, you know, you can be looking at how is a child orienting their scribble even. So if you start to see a vertical scribble and then a horizontal scribble prior to two years old, then you know, okay, we're starting to move towards those pre-writing shapes that we want to be um, looking at. And eventually we'd go from that scribble to being able to form one individual line one way or the other. Now, this follows um, a sequence in the shape, and it also follows a sequence in how the shape is presented. So typically imitation is going to be the easiest way for a, a child to begin to work on these skills. So when I say imitation, you know, sitting down and actually physically drawing the line and then, you know, maybe handing over the marker, hey, bud, you try they can see the motor plan, they can see it happen in real time. So it gives them a lot of information. So imitation is always where we typically start when we're starting to teach these skills. After that, um, it can really kind of diverge depending on an individual skill set. So if an individual um, is good with their motor, but perhaps has uh, a little bit of a barrier with their visual, tracing is going to be easier for them than copying because they have the visual of the line, for example, right there, and their motor is strong. So they don't have really a uh, difficulty tracing clearly across that line. If the opposite is true um, and they're good with their visual, they can see the image and then drop their eyes down and copy. But they might have some difficulty with their motor, then being really precise along a line is going to be tricky for them. So that's where, you know, an occupational therapist can be helpful in isolating, okay, is this a visual? Is this a motor, a combination? What's the best way to present these pre-writing shapes um, to set this child up for success? Um, we typically use standardized assessments to kind of make that determination. So you can see here, um, that around three and a half, four years old, they're starting to cross that midline. That's a really important, you know, neurological developmental milestone for kids to then be able to read and write. Um, being able to cross your midline, both gross motor and visual motor and fine motor uh, is a big step towards gaining that fluency in reading and writing, which will come down the line. So when you look at these, you can see, okay, a vertical and a horizontal line. That's going to make up your E, your F, your L, your H. Uh, circles obviously, you know, have that relationship. Um, that cross, that's going to be your lowercase t. Diagonal lines, that's going to be your K, your R. X is an X. Your, your triangle, that's very similar in shape to an A. So when we look at 
handwriting, obviously sometimes we just want to go, okay, we want to work on handwriting, ABC, here we go. But when we look at this, we can see that, you know, a triangle is being looked at at five years old and that's A, right? So the, one of the most complex shapes to form for children is the first letter of our alphabet. So there are optimal ways to approach uh, handwriting that's going to developmentally mirror um, how they're going to learn their pre-writing shapes, which developmentally mirrors, you know, how children will orient and work their way through shapes um, developmentally. So again, you know, I, I certainly know three-year-olds who are writing their letters. That is great. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of them enjoy it. Um, but if they're not, that is completely fine, and, and we don't need to be concerned about that. Um, so around four or five is when we start to work on capital letters, which are typically easier than lowercase letters. They might be um, learning how to write their name because typically kids will be motivated by that. Some kids might have tricky names. Um, so in that case, we still support them through that. We can still work on it, but we're not going to be so worried if they can't write, you know, if their name is Alex, for example, and they have that tricky A and they have that tricky X. Um, we might focus more on, okay, I'm going to write the letter A. Now you write the letter L. Okay, how about you do E and then I'll do the X. So you can kind of fill in and help support them so these activities aren't becoming aversive uh, if they haven't had an opportunity to really master that skill yet. Uh, again, which would be completely developmentally appropriate. Uh, around five or six years, we start to see kind of more complex formation of, um, you know, images of people when they're coloring, they can identify most uppercase letters, most lowercase letters, um, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily writing all of them fluently at this point. And at around six is when we would be looking at, you know, both the upper and the lowercase alphabet. There would be errors there, particularly things like reversals um, with letters like R, B, D, things like that. Um, but we would be looking at, you know, some fluency around upper and lowercase for the most part. So as I referenced earlier, um, uppercase is lower, uh, it, uppercase is easier to teach than lowercase. And um, working with that developmental sequence that mirrors the pre-writing strokes allows us to be really successful um, in, in teaching. So it, we don't really follow an A, B, C order. We follow a straight line letters, a curved line letters, mixed line letters, and then finally you get your diagonals and your midline crossing. So L, F, E, H, T, I, then we're gonna move into our curves, which is our U, C, O, Q, G, S. J really is, represents our shift into, now we're mixing directions. So we're gonna start with the vertical and then we're gonna go into a curve. Um, we're gonna start with a, that straight line for the D and then we're gonna give it a big curve. So we start to ask children to pivot their directionality when they are developing their letters. Um, I would say that, you know, we want to be particularly aware once we get into like the R, K, A area, you know, if they're having difficulty with it, okay, what is their age? Is this a good time to take a little pause, continue our mastery of straight and curved lines, and then perhaps push into our diagonals when we are four, five, five and a half? So if you reach kind of the limit of success and you start to get some pushback um, and it's kind of developmentally in that, that area, it's, it's perfectly appropriate to, to kind of continue that mastery, continue making it a positive interaction with those letters um, until, you know, such time that we feel we can be a little bit more successful. When we're looking at lowercase letters, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take those uppercase letters that we can, and we're just going to shrink them down. So C, O, S, V, W, T to a certain extent. Um, they're really just miniature versions of what they've already mastered. Uh, after that, we're going to work into our curved lines, and then we kind of push into our vowels, and then we start looking at the directionality of this number is going to dive down. I'm sorry, this letter rather is going to dive down like your P, your J, your uh, and your Qs, things like that. Um, so again, uppercase, 
always a great place to start. Uh, nice block letters. We read from top to bottom, left to right. Um, we organize Excel spreadsheets, top to bottom, left to right in squares. That's how our brain likes to organize information. So the more that we can mirror that with how we're teaching, the more um, natural it's going to feel for our kids. Now, a fun thing to do is to go through and write your alphabet. And if you start your F from the bottom going up, or you know your E goes down and over, and then you work your way up, that's fine. Uh, obviously, you've mastered that skill. But as we're teaching it, if we have the opportunity to teach it from the first time, we always try to start our letters in the top left-hand corner, working down and to the right. So I want to get a little bit into you know some of the functional applications of fine motor and expand it beyond what we usually think about it, um, which is typically that that drawing and that handwriting. So fine motor is a massive part of everything that we do. Of course, for kids, a, a big part of it is going to be the painting, the coloring, things like that. But children also need their fine motor to pick that Cheerio up off their plate, use their spoon. They need it to button up their shirt to grab their pants to pull them up. Um, children need fine motor for their gross motor games. Um, when they're grabbing onto a ball, they are relying on those fine motor muscles to you know, collapse around that object. Similarly with, um, with games and, and interactive games with their peers, you know, if they're working on a board game or um, Connect Four or something like that, they're gonna rely on that pincer grasp to be able to use the different tools of that game functionally. Children very often use their fine motor to communicate. So whether or not that's ASL, whether or not that's a point, um, they're gonna they're gonna rely on that to to communicate with you. And finally, hygiene. Um, obviously, you know, to scrub their hair, to wash their hands. Fine motor is something that we rely on throughout our entire day. Um, so if you're if your child right now isn't necessarily sitting down to color, that doesn't mean that there's a major fine motor problem. Um, that means let's look right now for other opportunities where they are engaging that fine motor and, and really focus in on that and use those as our opportunities to target fine motor. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be sit down at a desk and you know write ABC. It can look a lot of different ways. And that's still really great and really valuable fine motor practice for them. So I did want to make sure that I was getting to, you know, the the what can we do at home to be creating these opportunities. Um, so it might be, you know, that you're going to work on a craft and they're going to participate in one component of that craft. And that's going to be squeezing the glue. That's really, really good hand strengthening. Um, right here we have Theraputty, which is the OT's bread and butter. So uh, it's a little different to Play-Doh in that it has a little bit more stretch and more resistance. Um, so that allows for some really great hand strengthening. One of my favorite games is to take Theraputty and embed little figurines in it. And, oh my goodness, the elephant's stuck in the mud. Can you help them? And they're using that pincer grasp. They're using that non-dominant hand to stabilize. They're stretching, you know, they will problem solve to get that figurine out. And in the meantime, you're getting phenomenal opportunities to, to um, engage a lot of different fine motor skills. Um, I also love using spray bottles. You can use it in a lot of different ways. Sometimes I'll have children, you know, draw a target. Uh, we put it on the wall and then we use a spray bottle to shoot it. Um, sometimes we will, you know, uh, water a plant. Other times we'll get our toy cars really dirty and we'll use the spray bottle to do a car wash. So, you know, if you've ever used one of those when you're you know, washing your windows or something, you you do that a couple of times and all of a sudden you're like, oh man, this is seriously a workout. So it's amazing for hand strengthening. Um, same with hole punching. You can get ones that are you know, stars or hearts or whatever the case may be and, and use it to kind of decorate um, a, a fine motor craft. Um, Gross motor. I, I never want to lose track of how important gross motor is to fine motor. Um, we have to have that gross motor core, you know, and postural strength to be able to use our fine motor. So we call it 
proximal stability for distal mobility. Um, so when you think about maybe someone who's walking a high wire, if someone were to come along and say, hey, could you write your name on this? They'd be like, absolutely not. Everything is going into keeping myself upright and keeping myself balanced. It goes the same for when we're sitting in a chair. Um, if we don't have our feet flat on the ground, if we're kicked back, um, that's going to compromise our fine motor because our gross motor is going to kick in and focus on keeping us upright. So if we have really great strength um, in our core and in our limbs, we're going to get much better fine motor. So if your child is in a place right now where fine motor is not their thing and they're really you know, great with gross motor and they're climbing and they're grabbing and they're flipping upside down, they're actually doing some really important foundational work for their fine motor, you know, down the line when they engage in that. So, you know, something like a frog jump um, that these kids are engaging in, keeping that flat palm and pushing up off the ground, uh, phenomenal hand strengthening activity. Um, and then finally, you know, just incorporating kids in your everyday life. Obviously, you know, we have to be um, all hands on deck when we get hand a kid a sprayer, but it can be, you know, a great opportunity again for them to be squeezing. Anytime we're getting that squeezing motion, we're working what, you know, I showed you earlier, those intrinsic muscles and those muscles in your forearm, all of which are super important for our fine motor activities. Crossing midline. Um, so again, referenced, you know, with that, that you know, that cross plus sign shape and also with an X. Um, midline is really important for, again, our for our reading and our fine motor. And so these are some activities that you can do that don't necessarily involve making an X or making a cross, you know, if that's not appropriate yet. So having a child, you know, run their trains in a figure eight along the track, doing a patty cake game. Um, if patty cake game isn't necessarily appropriate because it's it's too complex, you know, just being like, touch here, try this one, let's grab me or, you know, high five up, high five down, high five to the right, high five to the left. Um, and card games, simple card games. This does not have to be poker. It can be something like you have a black pile and a red pile and with one hand, you're sorting red to red and black to black. And they're, you know, on either side of that child's midline. So they're having to cross to sort. Um, that can look a lot of different ways. So when we see some difficulty crossing midline, which will look like um, a child maybe will starburst that plus sign. So instead of doing two lines, they'll do short line, short line, short line, short line, and they'll, they won't cross in the middle. So that's an indication that, okay, we need to be looking at our midline a little bit to help create that fluidity across the body. We'll start big and then we'll work our way down. Pincer grasp. Um, these are things that I use all the time when I'm working on pincer grasp. For some kids, you know, I'll take a whisk and I'll put a bunch of pom poms in it and I'll hold it up and I'll have them grab the pom poms out of the whisk because obviously of the metal pieces, they have to isolate that pincer grasp to go in and be successful at grabbing the pom poms out. I love stickers. Uh, you can typically find a sticker for every child that they are motivated by, whether it's baby shark or, you know, safari animals or bright colors, whatever the case may be. Um, that's something you can really grade. So you can start with the puff um, ones that are going to be easier to grasp and pull and peel. And then you can work down to the ones that are flush and they're going to have to really get in there and isolate that pincer grasp really well to be able to get that sticker. Um, you can also grade this activity up. So we might just start with stickers and we're just putting them wherever we want. And then maybe we'll add in, we're going to have them go across a line because we're going to want to work in some pre-writing as long, uh, you know, along with our pincer grasp. So we can target multiple things at, at one time. Anything like a piggy bank um, or a connect four, for example, where they're having to pick up a token and put it in phenomenal pincer grasp. Uh, block play is definitely going to help isolate that pincer grasp. It might not be appropriate for um, your child or the child that you're working with to, to stack right now. Uh, we can use Duplo box so that they stick together. I also love magnetic blocks, which you can get on Amazon. And that helps kind of mitigate some of the precision that we might not want to be targeting right now. Um, also something as simple as a colander and some pipe cleaners. So this can either be that they're threading them through or sometimes I like to thread them through and leave 
maybe half an inch and flip it over. And, you know, we're making the, the head's hair grow or we're pulling the snakes out of the grass, whatever kind of imaginative play activity that might, you know, be salient with the child that you're with. These are all great ways to isolate that pincer and they can pull it out uh, and they get a big kick out of it. So these are all, you know, ways that hopefully with things in your environment, you can start to tackle that pincer grasp if um, that's something that's a priority for you. Scissor skills. Um, so essentially anytime you're uh, targeting anything with a squeezing motion, um, you are targeting scissor skills. So we love to use tongs. So for example, you can see kind of like a, an animal rescue happening here in the corner where a child is using tongs to go in and grab their, their toys up out of a bin. Um, I really like drawing a face on construction paper and then I will cut strips and then, you know, I'll just pretend, hey, this monster has a crazy hairdo, let's give him a haircut. And they're snipping across the top of those things and they're giving that monster a little haircut. Um, below right here are two scissors that I like to start with for children who are just getting into scissor skills. They're both spring loaded. So um, the tricky part of scissor skills can often be that, that extension. So pulling that hand apart. A lot of times they can squeeze but then opening up again, it, you know, can be a barrier. And these scissors mitigate that issue until we can fade them back. Um, if you have a child where isolating that pincer grasp into the loops is difficult, then I love using what's called loop scissors. That's when they can just hold on to them and squeeze um, and make that whole motion a little bit more successful for them. Then I'd move to spring. And then once they master that, then I would move to um, just child scissors without that spring component so that they're working on that extension piece. Um, as far as where to start and where to go with scissor skills, we're always starting with snipping, um, three to 10 snips. Once they do that, we'd look at cutting a piece of paper just in half. Um, from there, we start to want to work on the precision piece. So from there, we start to add in a line um, and then, which is five and a half inches long, ideally. And that child is cutting along the line. And from there, we'd work on basic shapes. Um, here are some great kind of basics around coloring, handwriting, and marker grasp. Um, so a lot of times if you're seeing that persistent fisted grasp, it can be really tricky to evolve the grasp because the child up until that point has been successful with it. They can draw their line, they can color in. Um, and so, you know, kind of like, why would I evolve towards this pincer grasp, which is a little bit more fiddly and a little bit more complicated. Um, so here are some ways to just kind of contrive those opportunities. One would be what's called rock crayons. Um, because they're short and they're wide, you're taking away the surface area that uh, a child is using for that fisted grasp. And as soon as that disappears, well, then they're going to have to modify their grasp because they have less to hold on to. Um, also, just taking crayons and breaking them in half also achieves this really, really effectively. So you don't necessarily have to go and get the specialized crayons. You can just take what you have um, and break a few and hand them over and you start to see that pincer grasp spontaneously emerge. Um, I also love using what's called pip squeaks. So they're basically markers that are quite small. Some kids really prefer to work with markers. Um, so you can give them broken crayons or, you know, little, um, little objects all you want, but really they're like, I'm more of a marker kind of girl. So that helps, um, allow for for kids who really only want to participate with certain mediums. Um, so these guys are really great. Another thing I like to do is I take the cap of the marker off and I have them hold it in these fingers and I say, you know, don't drop it. And, and so we're helping to contrive that pincer grasp, both with the size of the marker and also giving them just a little tactile cue in the palm of their hand to keep that those fingers down. You can also use pom-poms, you can use Play-Doh, um, basically anything that's gonna fit you know, in the palm of their hand and be able to be held successfully with these two fingers. As far as grips go, I really like this grip for the same reason, um, because it gives that feedback on the palm and gives them something to hold on to that helps support their maintenance when they're using that pincer grasp. Um, and 
Down below, you see what's called a slant board, which is really helpful with wrist positioning. Um, again, when we're talking about that stabilization piece to help prevent fatigue, having a slant board can really help um, maintain that wrist position that we're looking for. You don't have to go out and buy a slant board. You can take um, an old three ring binder and it achieves the exact same thing. Really, we're just trying to create an angle there to shift that wrist into slight extension, which is where we want it to be when they're writing. Um, and then this final thing is just um, with the, the school buses and all that is just a reminder for me to talk about um, following motivation. You know, I've had clients in the past where, you know, I'm working on my standard eval and I, I just present a marker neutrally and, you know, you get that hand extension. They don't want anything to do with that marker. They don't want anything to do with fine motor and that's fine. Okay. We know that that's where we're at and how are we going to push forward? Um, so for example, if you had a client who, you know, or a child who really loves cars, you might start with working on a car ramp and that car ramp might have you know, a school bus and a purple car on the car ramp. And then you might start modeling, drawing that school bus, drawing that car. Um, and you might ask them to color in a scribble of purple for the car. Um, you know, oh my goodness, it's a purple car, but he's, not, he's missing his purple. Can you help it? And you might get a little spontaneous scribble and then that's it. And then you just keep on working based on their motivation to evolve that from, I don't even want to look at a, a crayon to, okay, I'll pick it up to color the color purple to let's do its wheels. This car needs a road. Let's work on our horizontal lines or our vertical lines. Um, and, you know, I've had clients who have gone from, from that, from that complete avoidance of even the presentation of a marker to working on straight line letters, um, because we started with really hands-off, really naturalistic, really um, intrinsically motivated engagement with that fine motor. Um, and we just pushed it strategically knowing, okay, if we get the scribble, then we know we can go to a vertical line. Now we've got the vertical line working on the cars, you know, and the road, well, let's make that car go off to the right. And now we're working on our horizontal line. Now we're gonna give it a roundabout. Um, and we're gonna work on the wheels of the car because we know circle comes next. So when you use, you know, the developmental milestones to not skip any steps or jump too far and make it too difficult, um, you can really kind of naturalistically evolve their fine motor skill set in these ways. A couple, you know, kind of tools that I, I love and use constantly are things like doodle mats. Um, kids love water play. Many kids love water play. Um, and so you can have these <clears throat> um, stencils or, you know, water markers. And it's great when you can have kids working on mats because they have to work on their postural control muscles to keep their bodies up while they're working. Um, they, it's great for wrist positioning when they're working on the ground or they're working on a vertical surface. Um, so I love doodle mats. I definitely recommend those. Um, some kids, you know, I, I tend to steer away from technology um, in my sessions personally as a therapist, but sometimes it is the best entry point to um, use as a bridge from, you know, maybe a technological, you know, presentation to a pen and paper presentation. Um, so something like an app called Learn to Print is really helpful because you can be using a stylus. So again, you're getting that, you know, those grip opportunities by using those styluses to um, connect dots or follow pathways that are vertical, horizontal, circular. Um, you can start to work on scanning from left to right by using something like the touch option, which is gonna present different images that they touch one at a time, typically top to bottom, you know, left to right. So technology can be a tool where you can productively work on fine motor. Obviously you're gonna get that digit isolation, which is really great. Um, so, so there are opportunities there to, to use technology to your advantage when you're working on fine motor. Um, something like a, a writing glove can be helpful. So this glove basically isolates those pincer grasp and, and keeps that, those other fingers um, down and in. I've seen therapists you know, being creative, you know, working in EI and in homes, you know, take a sock and poke two holes in it and have the client put their finger through the holes. And you basically created that writing glove that, you know, could be quite cost prohibitive. And, and now you've got an accessible writing glove 
right there to, to work on that day. Um, and then worksheets that are geared towards the child's interests. So, uh, you know, if you have a child who loves construction, all the worksheets should be a construction truck trying to drive towards, um, you know, a pile of dirt or whatever the case may be. It might be uh, a minion who's trying to get to a banana. So it's all about just what is the child motivated um, by and, and how do we help facilitate and engage um, and create narrative play around these fine motor opportunities. So it goes less from, you know, we're going to draw a bunch of lines and now all of a sudden, you know, we're going to help the minion get to the banana. So for dressing, fine motor obviously, you know, is heavily involved in dressing. Um, when we're working on something like buttons, very often it's more helpful to have it in front of them, again, on a slanted surface right in their midline um, and, and have, again, larger size is your, always your friend with fine motor. We want to start with big buttons and work down to little buttons. We want to start with big zippers and work down to little. Um, if you're working on th something like dressing, <clears throat> We might want to start with scrunchies because um, that can be really helpful because they can see their toes, they can see the process, they can grab them with both hands. Um, so using a tool like that as again as a bridge towards pulling on their socks, which can be a really fiddly and frustrating fine motor task, uh, can be a great way of breaking that down. Feeding, a uh, common refrain, you know, if we have you know, these narrow things for them to grasp onto. Um, they don't really have a good sense of where it is in their hand. It can be a barrier between them and their food. Uh, so you see a lack of engagement around utensil use because they can be frustrating to use if you're working towards fine motor. So built up handles can be, uh, again, really helpful way to mitigate that. Um, if you have a child who has a lot of spontaneous extension, so they're holding on to something and then they just drop it, um, using these um, rubber grips to help create a cuff essentially so that they can be successful when holding onto their utensil. Uh, even if they have that spontaneous extension, they can just re-grasp um, and then they can carry on eating using that utensil. And then communication. Um, I am a big fan and proponent of, you know, using ASL to, to help kind of facilitate and help support uh, language. It's uh, just another way for children to process um, information and also to communicate to you. So, um, you know, using sign language such as more, but that's that bilateral integration at midline that we were talking about earlier. Um, that is synchronous, right? Both hands are doing the same thing to communicate something to you versus a help. We've got one flat hand and one hand doing a thumbs up for a help. Um, we've got yes, we've got no, we've got milk. Um, so I really love fine motor um, and communication when we can marry those things together, it can really help reduce some frustrations around access, increase communication, and really start to work on that hand strengthening and that digit isolation that we want to see that's going to be the foundation um, for a lot of our, their activities that they engage in throughout their day. Um, so I think the sooner and the more the merrier as far as using um, child-friendly ASL as, as a method of sort of facilitating those interactions. So um, I would love to open up for some questions. I see a couple here, so I will try to pop into those. Signing classes, that is a great question. So I know a lot of signing like resources. Um, so really something as simple as um, Googling like child ASL or sign language for children. Um, and you get some really, really robust um, online resources, there's videos, um, and there's, you know, age ranges and things like that. There's also like ASL child dictionaries that you can use, um, where you can <clears throat> make sure that, you know, what you're, what you want to be targeting is going to be, um, again, developmentally appropriate. Um, so my recommendation as far as the ASL goes is really just to go on to like an ASL dictionary um, and they all have accompanying videos. They're phenomenal resources. Um, the silverware grippers, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to grab that. Um, that is something where, so 
Um, we're going to be sending you each an email with a copy of this and um, we can absolutely make sure that I have that resource for you. Um, it will be included in the email. So I will have to go in and grab those uh, silverware grippers. I just want to make sure I'm getting you the right name. But if you were to look at us like something called like a universal cuff, for example, or a child cuff for silverware, typically that's going to bring up a lot of um, those options for you. And as far as fine motor, but gross motor may be lacking, um, that's a great question because that, that certainly is the case for, for many kids. You know, they may excel in their fine motor um, and their gross motor may not be necessarily where you might expect it to be. Um, this is Again, we'll have to do a gross motor presentation to kind of work through, um, again, the milestones and, and how to target them. But my focus would be, you know, working on things like balance and coordination. So uh, it can be something as simple as putting down um, you know, painter's tape on the, on the ground and saying, you know, my goodness, there's a shark in the water. Let's get across the bridge, stuff like that. Um, always starting with, um, two hand support and then fading back and always testing that line for where they are and how they're functioning at that time. Um, we really want to, uh, presume competence in everything that we're doing. So everything should be kind of give it a try and then test those limits and then always come back in and, and provide that support and, and end on a success. Um, so when we're looking at gross motor, um, I'm a, I'm a really, really big proponent of, you know, going to the playground is time extremely importantly well spent for kids. So that's not just like free time for them to, to let loose. They are learning so much about their bodies and building so many foundational skills and muscles when they are engaging in, in like playground play. Um, so I would really, really, you know, encourage to, to the extent to which you can recreate those opportunities either in your home or, or in your schedule um, is absolutely really, really um, critical to their, their development. Um, and if if you don't have a, a playground accessible to you, for example, doing things like putting the couch cushions on the ground and, and jumping onto them, making forts, um, helping with the laundry. So having, you know, them put all the laundry in the laundry basket and they're the ones to push it across the, across the floor. Um, activities like that really works all of their muscles. And so in almost um, any daily activity, you can be saying, all right, we're going to go upstairs. Should we hop up the stairs or should we stomp up the stairs? And those are going to be working different types of muscles. So any sort of transition in your home can be an opportunity um, when you have the bandwidth to, to be um, something where like, all right, we're going to bear crawl and we're going to work on those that like intrinsic hand strength and things like that. Um, I know that was a long winded answer, but. Um, as far as translation, we have really great resources at Beerman as far as translation goes. Um, that's certainly something that I can um, source for you. Um, and I'll, I'll have to just speak with uh, our translating department on how best to get you those resources in Spanish. So I'll take your name down right now and um, we will look to get you this information um, in a way that is most convenient for you. Does anyone else have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. I really enjoyed speaking to you about fine motor today. Um, if anything comes up, please, you know, continue to think of us as a resource. I'm always happy to answer any questions. Um, my name is Maeve London. I am uh, the director of occupational therapy. So if you move towards occupational therapy, you're definitely going to be able to find me. Um, I really, you know, I, I have a lot of resources and I really enjoy talking about fine motor, gross motor, sensory feeding. Um, so if you have any questions like that, please consider me a resource. Um, and Beerman, we have so many really um, amazing clinicians who, who um, have wonderful information to share. So um, thank you for allowing me to share um, on fine motor today. And I hope to see you all again soon.